Good morning, Destiny family. It's great to be with you. Are you excited to be here on a Sunday today? So good to be here. Hey, come on, let's stand on our feet. You ready to get into the word today? Come on. Pastor Obed sends his love all the way from Louisiana. And if you've been tracking him, you know that he went out there and he's had game day yesterday and he's having a blast. So I'm, I'm excited for him. I think it's a great time to just get away, enjoy football. And our pastors are there, so he's got a chance to get with them and he's preaching today. So he sends our love, his love for you. And I just want to take a moment and acknowledge him too and just take a moment and honor him. I'm just so thankful that we have a pastor that is willing to lead us and not only lead us but be led and take time away. Because how many of you know when we don't take a time away from our, for ourselves, that's when we get burnt out. That's when we get just kind of under, under the weather of everything. And so I just am so thankful that he does that. I want to let you know that he loves you all immensely. And he loves me. And I'm, and I'm in love with him. So I'm thankful for that. So come on, can we just honor him this morning? So we're jumping in. Our theme scripture for this series is 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7. And it says, we are like common clay jars that carry this glorious treasure within so that the extraordinary overflow of power will be seen as God's and not ours. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for your incredible word, your life-giving word. And today, Father, we lean into all that you have for us, not just for our neighbor, not for the person around us, but all that you have for us today, we thank you. We thank you for the spirit of revelation, the spirit of transformation, and the spirit of inspiration. God, that we will not be the same after hearing this message today. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. Hey, take a moment. Just clap for our online uh, audience today. Welcome wherever you're visiting. We're so glad that you've joined in with us. Give somebody a high five. Tell them that they are all that and a bag of chips with a Kit Kat in the bag, as my husband loves to say. You know, last Sunday, Pastor Nate kicked off our series of the art of being unordinary. And I don't know about you, but so often, all of our lives, we've tried to be ordinary. You know, we're not trying to really be unordinary. I mean, you all remember that the one that was at school that really didn't fit in, and we were all hoping that was not us, right? We did everything we could to be ordinary, everything we could to fit in, everything we could to not really stand out in kindergarten, preschool, elementary, middle school. We wanted to kind of fit in with the crowd, not stand out amongst us. And here, all of a sudden, we're hearing this series of, hey, we want you to be unordinary. And you're like, but all my life, I've spent time trying to fit in. But when you think about what God has done and who he is, he's an extraordinary God. And so he's not trying to fit us into this perfect little mold. He's actually trying to show off through us. And so what he's saying is, I want you to live an unordinary life. I want you to have unordinary faith. I want you to believe above and beyond. I want you to be able to see that I can do great things in your life. You know, ordinary simply means to have no special or distinctive features. How absolutely boring. We don't want to be that, right? This just simply means normal. It's a commonplace, a standard, typical. And then unordinary. Unordinary means to be extraordinary, exceptional, remarkable. Anybody want to be remarkable? Anybody want to be known for being special, exciting, memorable, noteworthy, unique? And, you know, this is what God is calling us to do, is to be, hey, I've, I've made you unique. You know, you think about even our very fingerprints. We all can say, oh, give me a high five and all these things. But, you know, even our fingerprints distinctly define who we are. And so we see that our God is not only unordinary, but our God is extraordinary. And the, so the word extraordinary means to be exceptional, remarkable, special, exciting, memorable. Our God is noteworthy. He is unique. And so when we think about what the Bible says in Isaiah 25, 1, he says, O oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you in praise. I will exalt your fame for you have done extraordinary things. 
We serve an extraordinary God. That's why we could be able to call upon him and say, God, thank you that today you're going to do extraordinary things. You're going to do things beyond what we could ever ask, think, or imagine. Things that we want to create in our own mind, God can do even better. God can take us even further. Think about every dream that you've had. Think about the things that God has done for you. Could you say, man, when I look back, I'm like, man, he outdid what I could have ever expected. He outdid what I could have ever asked for because we serve an extraordinary God. We also see in Psalm 139, 13 and 14, it says, for it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I've been what? Remarkably and wondrously made. So that same extraordinary God put his extraordinary within us. That word remarkably is the same word. So it means that this extraordinary God is within us. So that's why we can read this verse that says this common jar can have extraordinary power flowing within us. So basically, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is alive and well within us. And so we, the church, get an opportunity to show forth the power of God, show forth his praises. And so we begin to see this taking place in John 2, 11. We see the miracles of Canaan were the first of many extraordinary miracles that Jesus performed. And we can go through all the Gospels and see how Jesus turned ordinary situations into extraordinary moments. You know, you and I have ordinary situations that come up all the time that we have an opportunity to tap in and say, God, I thank you that you can make an extraordinary result out of this by the power of God. Things we can't do, but that he can do. The miracle of turning the water into wine. He, he enamored the people. People should be enamored by what they see going on around us. You know, we even see it in um, Daniel. It was because an extraordinary spirit, knowledge and insight, the ability to interpret dreams, cl clarify riddles, solve and complex problems were found in Daniel. You know, how about how, how many people can say of us, man, you have an extraordinary spirit. Man, there's something about you that stands out above the rest. And they called upon him because of that extraordinary spirit that was upon him. And then I think of in Acts 19, God was able to do this through Paul. So extraordinary were the mighty deeds that God accomplished at the hands of Paul. Wait a minute, was Paul a superhero? Did Paul have these super things? I mean, I sometimes wish, right, that in these ordinary situations, we had just these wonder twin power activate moments of like, come on, wonder twin powers activate, form me into whatever I need to be, right? You almost want to go, can I have these superpowers? But I'm going to tell you that Paul was not a superhero. If anything, Paul, originally known as Saul, was actually a persecutor of Christians. And yet God could use somebody who was, who was taking people the other direction, persecuting them for, for exalting the name of Jesus. And now he's put him at the hands of people saying he's done extraordinary things. So I want to let you know that we don't have to have any superpower. We have the superpower of the Holy Spirit residing within us. So all, all God is looking for is people that are willing. Here we see in Acts 4.13, Peter and John, others saw the boldness of Peter and John in that they were uneducated, ordinary men, but they recognized that they had been with Jesus. And what I really want to share with you today is that ordinary people can do extraordinary things. Ordinary people like you and I can do extraordinary things. And today I want to give, a, give us a chance to kind of dive into the life of a young lady. Her name was Esther. And you know, what's great about this beautiful woman, Esther, is that, you know, we, we hear this, the end of the story and we think it's absolutely amazing, but we don't realize how much the beginning is, it matters to the story. Because in the beginning, we see that here's just this sweet girl that she lost her parents. And when her parents died and now her cousin raised her. 
And her cousin Mordecai raised her, and he was a Jew. And so she grew up in this Jewish home watching him in the faith, watching him live out his faith. And so she was just a normal girl, but now there was an opportunity that, that, that he encouraged her. Hey, there's a position for the throne. There's a position to be queen. Why don't you go and take it? And so she went in and she went through all these beauty treatments and we see how this ordinary young girl was able to stand up for such a time as this and she was able to show forth her faith. And so when we live um, an unordinary life, it can lead to number one, unordinary favor. And I want us to see in Esther 2.17 that just this sweet little girl, it says that the king loved Esther. There was hundreds of women who came and went through the beauty treatments and tried out in some sense for this position and this role. But it says that the king loved Esther more than all the other women. And she obtained grace and favor in the sight more than all the virgins. So he set his royal crown upon her head and made her the queen instead of Vashti. And so here we see an ordinary person is stepping into an unordinary role, and we're going to see how she begins to do extraordinary things. And it begins by the favor of God. And you know, Psalm 512 says that, surely, Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with favor as a shield. And I want us to know that as, as, as an unordinary life, we walk in the favor of God. We should not be surprised when we see the favor of God at work in our lives. We should not be surprised when promotion comes from the Lord. Promotion doesn't come from the east or the west or the south. It doesn't even come from our boss. Promotion comes from the Lord. It is the Lord who ex exalts and places people into the rightful positions. And you know, from, a, from the, um, the mouth of a little nine-year-old boy, my son, I asked him, I said, Judah, hey, what does favor, what does favor mean? And he was like, well, mom, you know, I guess it's like, it's like if somebody is helping you and they're doing you a favor. And I said, you know what? That's a great way of explaining this. You know, if we think about God is helping us, God is giving us an extra advance. God is saying, I'm going to open this door for you that somebody else wouldn't have been able to open for you. I'm going to give you a little bit extra help. I'm going to bring in some extra customers. I'm going to help build up what, you, what you're doing because I see I want to bless what you're doing. God has, is helping our cause because we're helping him his cause. So recognize that we walk in favor. Tell somebody, say, I walk in his favor. The second thing that we see about Esther is not only did she have an ordinary favor, but she had an ordinary obedience. Esther 2.20 says, now Esther had not revealed her family or her people, just as Mordecai had charged her for Esther, what? Obeyed. Esther, what? obeyed the command of Mordecai as when she was brought up by him. Now, I want us to understand that with Mordecai, Mordecai raised Esther. And as Mordecai raised Esther, then we know that, that Esther was raised in his house, and now the tables have turned. And as the tables have turned, we see that now Esther is inside the palace. And she is the one who's in here, and she's the one who's now obeying what, what Mordecai is saying from outside the gates. Does that make sense? So here before, she was in a position of really having to be obedient to him. Now she's in a position of being willing to be obedient to him. And, you know, I think sometimes we get this, we get this part messed up. Because it's almost like we get into places of position, we get into places of, of authority, and we forget that it was God who placed us there, and we forget who helped us to get there, and we forget how important it is that if we have authority, we have to stay under authority. And so here we see that Esther was willing to stay under the umbrella of the authority that was given to her. And so, you know, I think about my, my sweet little children who... Um, are 9 and 11, and all they could really ask for is a dog. Now, if you know anything about my husband, uh, my husband likes a clean house, um, nothing smelly like a dog, you know, nothing that sheds like a dog, nothing that drools, nothing that goes to the bathroom other than his own kids, you know, that's about it, you know. 
And so I think about how my sweet little children, they, they, they just want a dog. And so, you know, a couple weeks ago, well, a couple months now, I was talking to my son, and he's starting to like, you know, well, let's, let's bargain here, Mom, you know? And he's like, well, what if, what if I had another kind of pet? And I'm like, okay, how about a fish? And he says, Mom, that's too boring. It just sits in the cage. I'm like, exactly, you know? That didn't go so well. So then he says, well, Mom, what about if we get a snake? Now, I don't know about you, but I don't really want a snake accidentally getting out of the cage. So, and I, no, Jude, I'm not really interested in a snake or a reptile. Um, so we compromised on a guinea pig. And uh, we now have a guinea pig. Yes, little Princess Buttercup lives in our home. And, um, and yes, he has bribed his sister now to take care of it. Um, I'm going to ask uh, DC and Nathan to come out just to help me out for a minute. But I want us to get a picture of what happens here because so many times in our obedience, obedience really is about developing a hearing ear. And so, so many times, I don't need the musicians, guys, but thank you so much. All I need is Nathan and DC. Thank you, sweetheart. Okay, so Nathan is here, and Nathan, and, and here we have DC who's representing the Holy Spirit, okay? So, so many times what happens is Nathan says, hey, God, this is what I want, you know? I would like to have, and we start putting out our wish list, right? You know, um, a beautiful young lady, which, you know, a, a young lady, and I want a dream job. I need a dream car. Get me my Ferrari. I mean, you know, get me the dream house. All these things, right? We put out all, everything that we want, all that wish list, and then we kind of turn around and we say, they, thank you, Holy Spirit. Can you bless it? And he's like, oh, okay. And so it's almost like we, we want the Holy Spirit now to follow us. Come on, follow me on my, this is, this is what I want. This is, this is my dreams. This is what I want. And, you know, obedience is actually the other way around, isn't it? You know, so actually what it says in Isaiah is it says that when you turn to the left or you turn to the, to the right, you will hear the voice behind you guiding you saying, this is the right path, follow it. So we have to actually go the other way and say, Holy Spirit, you know what? I am looking for a relationship and I am looking for a dream job and I am looking for all these things, but where are you leading me so that I can follow your steps? And guess what? He's like, well, he might turn and go this way. And so Nathan's going to follow him and go this way. When we are attentive to the voice of the Holy Spirit, thank you, gentlemen, then we can follow his path. The Bible says that the sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. And so when we tune in and listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, then guess what? We will be able to make those turns with obedience. And whether that obedience is a physical person like it was to Esther in that moment, it was Mordecai, or whether it's us just listening to the Holy Spirit. And some of you may say, well, how do I know, you know, if I'm hearing the Holy Spirit, I'm just going to encourage you that follow his peace. You know, there's a, there's a girl that everyone listens to right now when they're cleaning their closets, and then they say, does this bring you joy? Have you heard about her? You know, if this doesn't bring you joy, throw it out, you know? Well, I'm going to tell you the same thing. If this doesn't bring you peace in the decision that you're making, throw it out. You know, don't follow those things that are going to lead us into destruction. Don't follow those things that we're uneasy about. Let's continue to Follow the steps. Don't get ahead of the Holy Spirit. Let's follow his lead, just like Esther did. The second thing that's important about obedience is to develop a repentive heart. And why do I bring this up? You know, we don't really see it um, in the life of Esther throughout the book. But, you know, last week, Pastor Nate, he brought us the message about King David. And I was thinking about how important it is that in our obedience, we don't always make it. We don't always get it right. Sometimes we miss the mark. And I think it's important for us to know that it's okay. Get yourself back up. Dust yourself off. Because we're all, we've, all, we've all missed the mark. There's going to be plenty of times in our lives where we're just not going to get it right all the time. But this is where we, we lean in, just like David did. David, you know, who was known as a man after God's own heart. David was the one 
who they who he called forth Bathsheba, who was this beautiful lady, and and I mean, you talk about desperate housewives soap opera, right? This is like this is the real deal, right? Brings her in, sleeps with her, and she she gets pregnant. So he says, okay, how about this? I'm gonna call for your husband, and we're gonna send him, you know, bring him in so he can sleep with you, and then nobody will know. Okay, desperate housewives, right? So then um, comes, and, and he decides, oh, no, I'm so integral. All my, all, my every, all my friends, everybody's out on the battlefield. There's no way I could do that. So David says, okay, plan B. And so he decides, I'm going to put him in the front of the battle so he can get killed. Desperate housewives, right? So he goes in the front of the battle, gets him killed, and then comes back, and then all of a sudden marries Bathsheba, and, oh, she's pregnant, everybody. Guess what? We're having a baby, you know? So you talk about, so, so all this story goes by, but I want you to see that even in this, David was approached by the prophet and David repented. David turned from his sin and he repented. This could have been the last time we heard of David. This could have been the end of the story as we know it. But David chose to continue to obey the Lord. He repented, he turned from his ways, and guess what? His son went on to continue his lineage. And I want to encourage you that there are going to be times when we don't understand, and we're in the obscurity moments of obeying God. And we're kind of going, God, I'm, I am obeying you, but I didn't know that this was the direction. I didn't know that this was, gonna, was what it was going to look like. Anybody ever been there? And you're like, I said yes to Jesus. I said yes to your way. I'm following you, Holy Spirit, but aren't we supposed to be going that way? Isn't it, isn't the, the landscape supposed to look a little bit differently? And so we begin to question. I want to encourage you to hold on to your conviction. Hold on to your following of the Holy Spirit. Hold on to that obedience because unordinary obedience is different. It's not going to look the same as everybody else. You know, you think about Joseph who had unordinary obedience. He followed God and he was even falsely accused and yet he continued to obey the voice of the Lord. We heard about Daniel who was thrown into the lion's den. Daniel had an ordinary obedience and he said, no matter what the circumstance looks like around me, I'm going to continue to follow you. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego thrown into the fire and yet what happened? They looked in and they saw there was a fourth person in the fire. And so I want to encourage you in 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 32, 7, it says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or dismayed for there is another with us that is greater with us than is with them. And I want to encourage you that in these moments of obscurity, in these moments of like Esther, she was being obedient. I'm sure there were plenty of other times when she was obedient to what, what Mordecai was asking of her. And we, they might not re record all of those areas. But even in that, she was obedient, and the Lord was blessing her every step. I want to encourage you that God is with you. Even in the times when it looks like, it feels like, God, where are you? I don't know where you're at in all of this. I want to encourage you. He's closer to you even in those moments than he ever is. And I want to just encourage you that there is another one who is greater. His name is Jehovah Jireh. His name is Jehovah Rapha. His name is Jehovah Nisi. He is our victory in our defeated places. And God is with us. And so Esther, we see that she walked in the favor of God. We we see that she walked in the obedience of God. And then another point that we see is that Esther had unordinary compassion. I want to tell you that what happens from here is that Esther was placed into a position where now she had to now start to show forth um, and tell everybody about what was going on within her, that she knew God. And so she's placed in this position where the Jews, her own people, were about to get killed. And so they were about to be killed, and so Esther was placed in this position of going, you know, okay, what do I do? So Mordecai comes to her, and he says, don't think in your heart that you will be able to escape from the king's palace any more than all of the other Jews. So what is he saying? Like, in other words, I've asked you to be quiet all this time, but now might be the time. And I, I don't know about you, but if I'm Esther, I'm thinking, wait a minute, all this time, 
You've asked me to be quiet, and now when my people are about to be killed and I'm about to be killed, you want me to step up and, and share my faith? Yeah, pretty much. That's pretty much what he's saying. You know, so the king's palace, don't, don't think you'll be able to escape the king's palace any more than all of the other Jews, but who knows if you've come to the kingdom at such a time as this. And I present to you, church, that there are times when God places us in moments, in situations, even in our jobs, in our workplaces, that he has brought us for such a time as this. You know, it was unordinary in her culture to be able to even say something to the king, to go before the king on behalf of her people, because the king had to summons her to him. The king had to raise his scepter and say, yes, I will even receive what you have to say. But Esther knew there must be something that's within me. And I want to encourage you that there was nothing on the outside that placed Esther in that position. Everything that placed her in that position came from within. And that was even her beauty. Her beauty was on the outside. But how many of you know that beauty also flows from within? It's called a quiet and a humble spirit. And I believe that Esther walked in that inner beauty, in that inner confidence. And she recognized that, hey, maybe I'm here. For such a time as this. Maybe I'm here. Maybe you're here for such a time as this. You know, Esther, she was prepared for God's purpose. And so in verse 15, it says, So Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, And so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. And so here she is, and she says, I'm going to do something unordinary, but I, I have the extraordinary God who's at work within me. And so she decided, I must be here. I must have been going through all of this to be prepared for this moment. I ask you today, what are you being prepared for? What is God doing within you today that, that is, is, is right now a such, a such a time as this moment? That it's not just an Esther, but that we're a church that's willing to rise up and to say, Oh no, God, I believe that you have placed us here at such a time as this. I believe that, it, that our value comes from within because of all that you've deposited within us. Esther prophetically demonstrated that even in the midst of a crisis, there's a God who has the answer to a problem. Before there was a flood, there was an ark. Before there was Haman who came in and wanted to kill the Jews, guess what? There was Esther and there was Mordecai. And I propose to you that you might be that Esther and that Mordecai that God has placed and positioned. Here's this cute little orphan girl that was a Jew who knew that a Jew would be on the throne at the very time that the Jews were going to be um, persecuted? God ordained every moment and every step. And God can, God can cause all things to work together for the good. 2 Corinthians 4, it says, Therefore we don't lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing and the inward man is being renewed day by day for our light affliction which is but for a moment, is working for us far more exceedingly and an eternal weight of glory. Esther was able to look beyond what was happening in front of her. And she was able to say, God, help me to see that there's a purpose in what you're doing. Help me to see that I am a solution to the problem here. You know, God gives us solutions. God gives us as a solution to people. God gives us, he gives us the hope that we can offer. We, we have the opportunity to just simply go out and pray for somebody. We have the opportunity to just say, hey, let me read a scripture with you. Let me bring you the, the light of his word, the encouragement. You know, my daughter right now, she's 11, and she's already preparing for the offering for our heart for the house because she knows that every year it rolls around and so the last couple of years she's made different things she's done like little gift bags and then she did like some art last year and then this year she's like mom i'm gonna make ornaments so she's already picked them all out she's ready to go why because she feels like that's her purpose she feels like that's her kind of like such a time as this she feels like if i make these ornaments 
this is my way of contributing towards having money to give towards the offering. She doesn't want to just say, Mom, Dad, do you have some, some money that I can give? No, she wants to say, I contributed toward this. You know, one of the girls that part of the church a couple weeks ago, and she came up to me and she said, Pastor, I, I, I do hair, and, and I really want to be a part of, as the prison program, as, as we're bringing people out, and there, as they're being released from prison, and they're trying to get back into the workplace, I want to be a part of, of fixing their hair and getting them all ready so that they can go out back into the workforce with confidence. What is your such a time as this? What is your ability to say, God, give me the, that compassion? How are we going to be a solution to the city around us? How are we going to be a solution? There's so many ways that we can just say, God, I'm just going to use what's in my hand, just like Esther did, and I'm going to be able to do this, you know? Um, it says, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And so I want to say that Jesus also went on behalf of us to the Father. In Hebrews 2, 12, 2, it says, we look away from the natural realm, and we fasten our gaze on Jesus who birthed faith within us and leads us forward into faith's perfection. His example is this. Because his heart was focused on the joy of knowing that you and I would be his. Because his heart was focused on knowing that you and I would be his. Because his heart was focused on knowing that you and I would be his. He went to the cross for us. He almost did what, what Esther did. She said, wait a minute. If my life is here just to help others to go forward, then so be it. Jesus did the same thing. It says he endured the agony of the cross, and he conquered its humiliation, and now he sits at the right hand of the throne of the Father. All because of what? The joy that was set before him. What was the joy? The joy was us. The joy was knowing that we would be his. The joy was knowing that he would have sons and daughters that were willing to worship him, that were willing to exalt him, that were willing to, to say yes to him. Because of that, he went to the throne for us. And, you know, I, I want to let you know that the queen before, before Esther, her name was Vashti. And, you know, the reason that she lost her position in the first place is because she wasn't willing to show her beauty in front of the king. I believe that God, our father is, the Bible says that he's looking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth, who are willing to show forth the praises of God, who are willing to show forth his praises, who are willing to say, God, I want your name to be exalted in my life. In my ordinary life, may your extraordinary things be done within me. I'm prepared for God's purpose. Tell somebody, say, I'm prepared for God's purpose. Say, come on, church, stand on your feet. I just thought it would be great to just kind of end in this song today. Did you enjoy the word today? Amen. I want to encourage you that we're prepared for his purpose that we've been here for such a time as this. So let's just sing this together these last couple minutes. I'm going to see your victory. Our battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. And I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle 